So we are in week four of the life of Joseph. And if you've not been with us up until this point, let me review just very, very briefly for you. Joseph is this young guy of 17 years old in the ancient world. He's the son of Jacob who has the 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. You remember him? And Joseph is 17 years old and he has this amazing coat, right? And he has this amazing coat, and he's got a bit of an ego as well. We explored that in week one. And his dysfunctional family and his brothers get a little bit mad at him, and they throw him into a pit. And then he gets sold into slavery. And then when he gets sold into slavery, it's not been dark enough in this story. It just gets darker. Somebody say amen to that. It gets darker. He goes and he serves with Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife makes an accusation against him. And she gets believed even though she was wrong. And he gets thrown in prison. And things just get worse and worse and worse. And we've been following Joseph. And last last week where we left him, Pastor Ricky taught us that he was in prison And between 17 years old and what we're about to read today is 13 years he's been waiting for things to finally take a positive turn. And today, if you've been waiting for good news, thank God, things finally take a positive turn today. But you might remember last week, he was interpreting dreams in jail. Do you remember that? So you had a baker and you had a cupbearer and they both had dreams and it went well for one of them and didn't go so well for the other one. And he interpreted both dreams correctly. And so he's not only a dreamer, he's a dream interpreter. And that's where we end up in today's story. This is chapter 41, verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, it's also going to be on your screens. This is the big turn. Two full years later, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River, which the Nile River was massive to them. It was part of their religion. It was the source of their commerce. Nile River was a big deal. In his dream, Pharaoh saw seven fat, healthy cows coming out of the river, and they began grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows come up behind them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin, and these cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. What happens next is really going to surprise you. Then the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up, probably in a sweat, probably in shock. I don't know that that was a a nice picture to see seven thin cows eat seven fat cows, but that's what happened. And then it says, but he fell asleep again, maybe even the same night, and he has the exact same dream. With different pictures, this time it's with heads of grain and stuff like that. But it's essentially the same exact dream. He gets the same dream twice, and he wakes up from the second one, and he's like, this was no ordinary dream. And someone needs to interpret this dream because he suspects it's divine in origin. Why? Because he got it twice. And he starts looking around for somebody who can interpret his dream for him. And so he gets all of his servants. He gets all of his wise men. He gets all of his musicians and asks them all to interpret what in the world did the seven fat cows mean? And he can't find anybody who can interpret it correctly for him. And then suddenly the cupbearer speaks up. Verse 9, finally the king's chief cupbearer spoke up, and today I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Do you remember what his failure was? He told Joseph in the last chapter that he would tell Pharaoh about him. And did he? No. It's been two years, right? Like, Joseph had given a great interpretation to the chief cupbearer. And all he asked him when he left is he's like, would you put a good word in for me? Because I'm languishing in prison here. And the guy goes off for two years and totally forgets Joseph. How could you possibly do that? Well, things happen. And the family got busy, you know, and life happened. You should see our schedule, you know. It's just, you know, we get this, you know. We move on, right? Out of sight, out of mind. And that's what the cupbearer does. And suddenly he remembers his failure. And he tells the Pharaoh all about Joseph. And he's like, I got just the guy for you. This guy knows exactly how to interpret a divine dream. The word divine there is important. Because you've had dreams before, right? And it was the bad pizza that you ate the night before. 
It wasn't divine. And I, I totally get that. But he has a divine dream here. And so he brings Joseph in. And before he brings him in, the scripture actually says, if you're reading it there, I'm skipping this part, but it actually says that they had to like shower the guy and shave him and put him in nice clothes because Joseph stank. Amen? He prison stank. It was not good at all. And they had to clean him up in order to bring him in the throne room. So do you see the picture here? Here he comes up all cleaned up, verse 16, and they ask him and he says, it is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied. But God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Now this is important. Don't miss this. Who's he giving the credit to? And we like, we all know like you're supposed to give the credit to God. We, we totally get that. But this is a guy who's stuck in jail. And finally, he's got his moment. And finally, he's with some important people who can influence his position. And finally, the spotlight goes on him. And he doesn't plug his new book, does he? He doesn't plug his reputation. He doesn't try to increase his own followers. Instead, he sidesteps and says, this is not about me. If you're looking for what I can do, I can't do anything for you. This is only God can do anything here today because this is a divine dream. And if you want this to go right, we need God to be here. Amen? He has humility. We talked in the, on the first week that Joseph was given from God some amazing gifts, some amazing natural, maybe even spiritual gifts his organizational ability, his ability to interpret dreams. All that stuff was great. But sometimes we have gifts and we have no character to go along with them. And it's important that God builds the character in our hearts to go along with a gift. He's got humility now, and that's important. Verse 25, Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. And then Joseph explains to him what the whole thing with the cows was all about was the seven fat cows, those were going to be seven good years, amazing years. We're talking bull market years. Everybody was going to get rich. Everybody in agriculture was going to do super, super well. There was going to be more food created in Egypt than any of those people could actually eat. And he's like, and not only was it going to be awesome, but after the seven good years, i.e. the fat cows, there was going to be seven thin cows, and it was going to be famine. And it was going to be so bad and everything was going to burn up and nothing was going to grow and the economy was going to be decimated and Egypt was going to be decimated and people were going to starve and it was going to be so, so bad in those seven years of famine. It was going to be so bad that everybody was going to forget the good years. And that's what the dream meant by they were swallowed up. And he knows that and he gives the interpretation for the dream Verse 32, as for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God and he will soon make them happen. This is, this is big. He says, Pharaoh, you are right to think that because you got this dream twice, it wasn't the pizza from the night before. It was divine. The divine spark is in this. But also... God is confirming the word that it will happen. This is not just a prediction of something that might happen. This will happen. God is determined it's absolutely his will that this will happen. I think this is also important for us. Okay, as Christians, sometimes we talk about the fact that God will sometimes give us a special message, right? Like, God led me to do this thing. I got an impression from God. I, I was led by the Holy Spirit to do X, Y, and Z. Or maybe I even got a vision or a dream myself in my Christian life. And when those things happen, that's wonderful. But 90% of the time, can I just say this? 90% of the time, we don't get those kinds of impressions from God. Instead, we operate according to wisdom, the wisdom that he's given us in his word. That's why we study the book of Proverbs together. Because learn these principles, get them into your heart, and let those things guide you the way of Jesus, right? That's 90% of the time. And then sometimes God comes in and he speaks something special. But when he does speak something special to you, get it confirmed. Get it confirmed. And what I love here is that Pharaoh's getting a message about an entire nation. And God cares about him enough to confirm it with a second dream. And Joseph rightly knows how to interpret that. Like, 
if you get a special leading from God and I need to uproot my family, put the house on the market and move everybody to Cincinnati tomorrow, you need confirmation. Amen? Right? Get some wise counsel. Check the word of God. Make an appointment with your pastor. Let's talk it through. But get some confirmation from the Lord because that's the way this works. Amen? It's the way this works. Verse 33. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. So this is Joseph still talking. So he gave him the interpretation of the dream. And now he's giving him a plan. Why would Joseph start giving him a plan? Because Joseph is a phenom. He's an amazing organizational administrative guy. We've seen that all through the last three chapters, right? Like he absolutely brought so much organization into Pharaoh's ho- or into Potiphar's house and then into the jail, right? He's a gifted guy organizationally. So he rolls right out of the interpretation and right into planning mode. And I love this. Look at the rest of what he says. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses, store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. What an amazing plan he's got. And you start to see God in the background of this too. Do you start to see it? Not every group of people nation in the ancient world, city in the ancient world, would have had so much wealth and organization already that they could have taken all the agricultural surplus from seven years and stored it in their major cities and storehouses. But God knew Egypt had that capability. And Egypt had that capability as long as they had the right person leading them to utilize it in the right way. See, the father knew that. And so the father has been working on his man, Joseph, and his administrative abilities, and he's brought him right to this moment, not only to interpret a dream, but to have a plan to save the ancient world from famine. This is a big moment. And Pharaoh gets it. Pharaoh sees the wisdom in this young man, and he's about to make Joseph prime minister of the whole land. Some of you guys know this part of the story. Joseph says, you ought to find somebody. And Pharaoh says, how about you? Which is super cool. It's super cool in two ways. Um, Number one, of course, Pharaoh has seen this, this young man with the divine spark in him. He's 30 years old at this point. And the plan that he just laid out, and he's obviously got the administrative ability. Maybe he would be a good person to be in charge of this whole thing. So that part makes sense. But the part that doesn't make sense, please take this in because the miraculous hand of God is behind it. The part that doesn't make sense is this guy's in jail. This guy is a foreigner. He's not Egyptian. This guy is a slave. He doesn't pass the background check. I wouldn't let this guy serve in the nursery today. (laughs) Right? Pharaoh's about to make him prime minister of Egypt. Why? Because God's behind this. The miraculous hand of God is causing him to prioritize what he's prioritizing and ignore the rest because God's going to save the nation through this young man. See, I told you the story was going to take a positive turn because from this day forward, Joseph is now out of jail. Not only do they clean him up, but he is wealthy instantly. He is comfortable instantly. Instantly, and you're going to see all of this. He, he has a family. God's going to bring him a family instantly. And he's got a purpose, doesn't he? God restores everything that was broken. In one brief moment, the whole thing takes a turn. It's amazing. I've got a layout for you of the story of Joseph according to his age. He's in the pit at age 17. Age 17, probably to age 23, he's, he's serving with Potiphar as a slave. Then he gets accused by Potiphar's wife, thrown into prison. Maybe he spends seven years, 23 to 30, and we definitely know he's 30 years old when he stands before Pharaoh and stands in the palace and actually comes into the palace. And then I marked purpose at age 39, and that's a little hint at next week because you don't want to miss next week. 
Because you could read the story up to this point and say, this is amazing. God has given Joseph all these amazing things. He's absolutely healed everything that was broken except his dysfunctional family. And the dysfunctional family is going to come back next week. And God's also got forgiveness and healing to bring there as well, which just shows even more of the purpose of God. God's will is being done in Joseph's life. He built the organizational skills. He built the character. God's will is being done in the ancient world. God is saving ancient Egypt, but he's not just going to save Egypt. You'll see it next week. God's God's salvation, physically giving these people food in the midst of the famine, it's going to go very, very wide outside Egypt, the lines of Egypt. So God is saving the ancient world from being decimated. And then God's will is going to bring salvation to Joseph's family and to his own heart as well. God's got a secret plan, and he's got all these massive threads going on all over the place that he's going to bring together and tie a nice little bow on for Joseph. Because that's God's will. Yes? That's God's will, and God is so good. And I keep saying the words God's will because God's will is a sticky phrase that we Christians use, and we slap on things sometimes, and I want to talk about God's will today. Because I see in this story what comes together, all these threads are all these different layers of God's will. And sometimes as Christians, we get confused and we get sloppy with this phrase, God's will. And so I want to dive into it. On week one, some of you guys were here for week one, and Joseph went into the pit. And I made the statement to you from this pulpit right here that God didn't put Joseph in the pit. His brothers did. And I made the statement to you that even though the pit is what got Joseph to Egypt so that God's will could ultimately be done, I think there's hundreds of roads that would have led him to Egypt. And it didn't have to go through a pit. And it didn't have to go through slavery. And that bothered some of you. And some of you reached out to me in the weeks after that and said, that bothered me. And here's the thing. We, we are in a church where the conversation can go back and forth. And it's healthy. And if I say something up here that doesn't jive with your understanding of Scripture, it's legal for you to send me an email. That's good. It's okay. Because I'm a pastor here, right? I'm not just a speaker. I'm a pastor. I want to be in relationship with you guys. And, like, you guys fire back your questions. And then we go back to the preaching team and we're like, how do we answer these questions better? How do we go a little bit deeper? Because sometimes your questions help us see the leading of the Holy Spirit in this congregation. And so I've come to talk about God's will and to try to go a little bit deeper on that idea. And hopefully this makes sense to you. So let's talk about God's will. God's will, I believe, are actually four wills in combination. So get your thinking caps on, class. Are you ready? Here we go. Step one is the sovereign will of God. And when we say God's will, we often think of the sovereign will of God. This is usually where our minds go. So the sovereign will of God is where God chooses something and it cannot be stopped. In Genesis chapter one, God said, let there be light. And the way this universe works, light had to emerge. When God said, let there be light, there was light. And there was no question, and it could not be stopped, because this is the power of an omnipotent creator. Yes? The sovereign, it cannot be stopped. Isaiah 46, 10. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens, says God. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. The will of God. The sovereign will of God. Now here's where it gets really messy and sticky. Next is the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God. What God allows. And I'm going to take a sticky concept and I'm going to read an even stickier passage of scripture to you about it. This is Job. This is Job chapter 1. And in this passage, this is one of the most ancient books in the scripture is Job. And the book of Job is about a guy who suffers And what the scripture tells us is that he was a righteous guy and he suffered. So basically, this ancient book of the Bible is trying to handle in an an entire book, why do bad things sometimes happen to good people 
Ever ask yourself that question? That's the book of Job. And so God gives us a scene here in Job chapter 1. Some of you guys have been reading ahead. But what it is is it's the throne room of heaven itself. And God is on his throne, and Satan comes into the throne room, and they have a conversation about this man named Job. And, it's, and Satan replies to God, have you not put a hedge around Job? Now, I'm going to stop you right there for a quick second. Some of you guys have been praying with Christians, and they have prayed that God would put a hedge of protection around you. This is where that phrase comes from, right here in Job. Is that the idea that sometimes, often, actually I would say all the time, God has a hedge of protection around you and your family. And we pray for greater protection sometimes. And sometimes God removes that protection temporarily for his purposes. It is still the will of God, but it's his permissive will and that matters. But now stretch out your hand, Satan says, and strike everything that Job has and Job will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man, on Job himself, do not lay a finger. And in this interaction here, and this is very complex and this is really going to make you struggle if you really think about it. But God says that hedge of protection that is around Job's possessions and his home and his family, I will temporarily lower that hedge, Satan, and allow you to have the cruel will over him that you want to have. Messes with us. Moments like this in, in scripture mess with us. I show you this. I show you this because God allows things to happen in this life and he has allowed things to happen in your life, but that does not mean it was his heart for you. There's a cruelty in Satan, in our enemy. Some of you don't believe in Satan. It doesn't matter. He's still there. And he still has an evil will and a cruel will for you. I heard Pastor Jack Hayford one time said, He said, if God had lowered the hedge completely, we would all be cinders tomorrow. Because that's his hatred for humanity. The fact that you're here means the hedge is up. And maybe you wish the hedge was higher in your life. But you need to know that cruelty that exists in the kingdom of darkness against you. And the fact that you are here and that you are breathing today is the protection of God. That's the testimony of scripture. And some of you would would think, yes, and, and not only the cruelty of the enemy and his kingdom against us, but also the cruelty of people, amen? There are cruel people in this world, and I'm one of them. Yes, depends on the situation. Yes, I remember being at a recovery meeting one time, and they had this great phrase. They said, They said, hurting people hurt. The reason they hurt you, parents and spouses and kids and friends, and the reason they hurt you is because they were hurting. There was a wound in them and they dealt a wound to you. This world is full of cruel people. And God's hedge protects us from them as well. And sometimes he removes it. And you're like, man, you're opening up a file here and I've got a thousand questions and I'm not going to answer any of them. We're just going to move on because I got to get through this message. But I know there's a lot that that brings up and your specific situations come charging up into your mind. Next is the dispositional will of God. The dispositional will of God says this. It says that God's heart may be in one place even though your circumstances are in another. The dispositional of heart, heart of God is that he wants this thing even though it might not happen. And we see this in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promises some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Ah, this is big, guys. In your understanding of God, A verse like this is big. God wants every single soul that ever lived to choose Jesus Christ and to be forgiven. That's what he wants. But does God get what he wants? No. You're like, well, he did when he said light had to come forth. Yes, that was his sovereign will. 
but his dispositional will, he does not always get what his heart wants. Why? Because there are other things going on. He allows us choice, does he not? Why would people not repent? Because they're choosing to not repent. There are many people in this world that will not choose Jesus Christ, and every single one of them will break his heart. That's what that word is saying there. And it matters to us that God does not look at those people who are choosing eternity apart from him and say, well, it was your choice. He is not flippant. That's what the scripture is saying. He longs for them to choose Jesus. He longs for them not to be destroyed. Matters. What is the dispositional heart of God is a big deal. Next, Psalm 19, verse 7. It says, The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. This is another part of the dispositional will of God that you need to, need to know. What God wants. What God wants is for you to never steal. But do you steal? God wants you to never lie. But do you lie? I'm just going right down the Ten Commandments. See, God has communicated to us what his dispositional will is for creation, for us, for our families. Doesn't mean we're doing it. But he still tells us. Why would he do it? Because he's warning us of the destruction that we're bringing into our homes and into our lives when we walk away from his will. He's warning us and he's teaching us the way of Jesus. He holds it out to us so that we could learn it and we could live a different kind of life. I said before, hurting people hurt, but not always Because sometimes we want to hurt others and we say that's not the way of Jesus and we don't. Because God in his grace has given us the Bible and told us what is right. Do you let that into your heart? The dispositional will of God is this powerful force in creation, in our world, and it can change you, amen? The way of Jesus Christ, I love that. Okay, next is the redemptive or rebuilding will of God. This is what God brings from all the bad. And this is what the story of Joseph is almost all about, is all that happens that is bad is, is like all these different threads of his life, and God brings them all together and somehow brings good out of it. The amazing creativity and power of God we see in his redemptive will Love this, Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. See, see, everything to work together, that's all the bad stuff in your life. How many times have you heard a Christian testimony where they say, here's all the bad stuff that happened in my life and look how God's now using it. That's a constant testimony. It's constantly what he's doing in his grace. And in his creativity, too. I mean, it's just amazing to me. It's like Siri in your GPS when you take a wrong turn. Or the third wrong turn today. And what does she say to you? Recalculating your route to the destination. Recalculating. And I know that's a bad illustration. But it's like, isn't that what God is constantly doing? Because some of you guys come to, come to church and you come to the scripture and it's like, man, if I don't marry the right person and I miss my soulmate, is it all crap now? Of course not. Because he causes everything to work together for good. That's constantly what he's doing. And he's better than Siri, amen? He's better than Siri in a whole lot of ways. Number one way he's better than Siri is he knew all the mistakes you were going to make from the beginning of time. Siri didn't. He's laid out a route for you knowing all the screwball things I would do. Yeah. And not only that, but he's laying out a plan. He's laying out a destiny for me that not only blesses me, but blesses my family, blesses my friends around me, blesses my church, blesses my community, blesses his eternal redemptive purposes. God's operating at every layer all the time. That's how massive his intellect is. Is your noodle baked yet? Yes? Hmm. Romans 8.18, I love this one too. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. And so even in the midst of his permissive will and 
Maybe the hedge gets lowered and you experience difficult times. We're given this promise that his redemptive will will ultimately lead us to a destination if we surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. But it will ultimately lead us to a destination where the blessings are so great, they absolutely outweigh the past. It's one of our great promises. He will wipe every tear away. Amen. Okay, so that was the brain-heavy stuff. Are you okay? Okay, that was the brain-heavy stuff. Now, some of you guys are looking at that, and you're like, I don't know if I could explain this to a friend any time ever. Like, hopefully you were taking really good notes, right? Like, and the next time I'm in a really terrible trial, am I going to remember all four points? No, you're not. Here's, here's what I really want you to know. I want you to know that this isn't some super deep theological thing like you might think it is. Actually, this way of thinking is how we think every single day in our human relationships, whether we realize it or not. So let me give you an illustration for that. Okay, so there's a, there's a guy, there's a dad, let's say, and he's got the grill going and the grill is nice and hot in the backyard and it's not gas, it's charcoal because charcoal tastes better. Can I get an Amen. Okay, it's a charcoal grill, and it's going in the backyard, and the kids are running around in the backyard, and he lets the kids run around, even though there's a hot grill back there, and one of them runs past and foolishly puts their hand on the hot grill. Now, what's going to happen? Tears, pain, crying, right? Like, that's the situation. What was the will of the father? What was dad's will? Can we walk through it? Number one is his sovereign will. Are there locks on the door at night so that evil people can't come inside the house? Of course there are. Are there fences around the backyard so that wild animals can't harm his children? Of course, on the big picture, his sovereign will is absolutely protecting his family. But when it came to that grill, he decided not to put his kids in straitjackets. He decided not to be a helicopter parent and always within a foot and a half of them. Make sure they're okay. He didn't do that. He didn't build a wall around the grill. So that's his permissive will comes along and says no straitjackets. Not only does he not put them in straitjackets, but what would a good father have done? Ask yourself that question. He would have warned them about hot surfaces. He would have warned them and, and, and he would have hoped that A warning from a loving father would have mattered to them, would have gotten into their thick skull. Does it always? No. (laughs) He would have hoped some of his kids would just take the warning and they would grow in wisdom without actually having to touch the hot surface. But he would know there was a chance that some of his kids would not be that wise and would not take his kind and loving warning. All the parents are really shaking their heads at me right now. I know. So what's his dispositional will? It's not their pain, but it is for their growth. And he knows that this may be the only way forward for a few of them, as difficult as that is. And I'm not going to put them in straight jackets because the character will never grow, right? It'll only be forced behavior. It will never be chosen within them. And God does give us a choice, doesn't he? And that choice matters because when our choice is present and operating and sometimes our choice leads to good things and sometimes our choice leads to bad things, what does it do? It grows us and we learn. And not only that, but it it pulls us alongside Jesus more and more and more as we confess to him and get his forgiveness and he gives us another chance. Do you see how it drives relationship? The wills of dad, it drove the relationship. He wanted them to grow, but he didn't want them to get burned. Don't think that to yourself. He didn't want them to get burned. Next, his redemptive will. He's going to walk with them, and he's going to help them with their healing. Some dads in that situation yell across the yard, told you not to touch it. (laughs) That's cold and unfeeling. That's not the heart of our father. So the dad in my illustration, he runs right up to him. And he throws his arms around him. And I'm so sorry. 
can we get that under some cold water? Can we get that bandaged up? And I'm so sorry you're hurting. And maybe there's some tears coming down this dad's face. Why? Because there's something about loving relationship where you enter into it with them, even if it was dumb. Yes? And that's his redemptive will. And he longs for them to grow even through the pain. We call in the church everything the will of God. And we get really, really clumsy about it sometimes. And we don't mean to, but sometimes we say things that hurt each other. And this might all sound like a lot, but I'm just trying to show you with the dad and his girl. We do this every day. We have the different layers in us and we understand it, but sometimes we just get clumsy in the church. And sometimes it's a, your baby died. And we say things like God needed another angel in heaven. And guys, no, no. We make God sound sometimes, we don't mean to, but we make him sound cruel and unfeeling. And there's a difference. There's a difference between the sovereign will and the permissible, all of it. And sometimes in our words, again, we don't mean to. And sometimes we want to be certain and we want to know the right answers because we've been a Christian for 10 years. In this situation, I ought to know the answer. No, you shouldn't. Step back in your humility and maybe in silence, put your arms around someone. And just love them. And it's okay to not know. You burned your hand. Pain came into your life. It doesn't mean the father grabbed your hand and put it against the grill. I know that's blunt, but sometimes in our theology and in our clumsiness, we make God look like that. No. No. Sometimes, too, we forget his permissive will. And we blame God for every striking blow in our life. And it's not him. And he is not cruel. And he loves us. And we need to see him for who he really is. Sometimes we also, on the flip side, we forget his irrevocable sovereign will. And sometimes we see so much power in the choices of people and the choices of the enemy that we find ourselves forgetting that our great and powerful God who loves us is actually in control. And that, yes, he may be lowering hedges. He may be allowing certain things. But that doesn't mean that the world is out of control. Oh, no. He knows exactly what's going on. And he has only allowed that hedge to be lowered to the level that he says it should be lowered to. That's it. And where do you see that the most clearly? Well, you see it in the promises of God. As you go into the scripture, read the promises. The promises are the fixed points. In scripture, there's so much that feels out of control. Yet my father will never leave me nor forsake me. Yet I will never be condemned for my sin if I am in Christ. I will always be forgiven and given grace and given mercy. That's a fixed point in the universe. No hedge will be lowered from that. Jesus will always be present with me. He is the Emmanuel. We learned that at Christmas. And he's always with us, never to leave us. Do you know that no grave is ever final? You've been at some deathbeds. You have been promised that no grave is ever final. You've been promised that all tears will be wiped away. You've been promised that justice will ultimately be done even though you swim in the midst of injustice every single day and it boils your heart sometimes. Yes? You've been promised that our cruel enemy will finally be defeated. Finally. So much we've been promised and in the midst of trying to figure God out, hold on to the anchor of what he's told us. We've got some life groups that you can sign up for after the uh, service is over, and we've been talking about that this morning. 
Many of the groups that are out there on the wall, they're doing a study starting in a few weeks, and it's called uh, Irrevocable Hope, I think, or un Unshakable Hope. Unshakable Hope, I think is the title. It's a Max Lucado study. He takes 12 weeks, and he looks at 12 of the different unshakable promises of God. Studies one per week. You need this in your life, amen? You need this. We also forget God's dispositional will. Where's his heart at? Some of you, this is not theory for you today. This is right where you're at, and it's right where you've been. Can I just give you some personal advice here real quick? When you're in the dark night of the soul, and when you're in the prison cell with Joseph, and you're looking up to heaven and trying to figure out how in the world could God allow this, could I encourage you to go back to the scripture and to see the heart of Jesus again and to realize that he is present with you with the same exact heart? For instance, when Jesus approached Mary and Martha at the death of Lazarus, what did he do? He wept with them. If you are weeping, Jesus is weeping with you. That's the reason that's in the Bible. So you would know that. When he's put in the situation, our precious Lord Jesus Christ, when he's put in the situation with the woman caught in adultery and she's about to be stoned and condemned and killed for her sin, what does he do? He gives her a mercy and a grace and a forgiveness that not only, not only forgives her, but protects her. And then what does he do? He gets down on her level and he talks to her like equals that that's the mercy and that that's the posture of Jesus Christ towards you. Remember this, that when, the, when Jesus himself was on the, the, the cross and, and the thief was next to him, Jesus has got the burden of the sin of the world on his shoulders. And the thief reaches out to him and says, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And you know what Jesus didn't say? I don't have time for you. I've got a lot going on here. Jesus has time for him. Jesus loves him. Jesus is never too busy. Some of you in your, in your dark night of the soul, and you're like, Jesus is too busy. No, he's not. Never. Not for you. Last passage I want you to see. This is verse 50. This is the postscript to Joseph's story. This is right after he's made prime minister. And Pharaoh takes one of the daughters of one of the priests in Egypt and he gives, him, gives her to Joseph as a wife and they form a family and he has these two kids and look at what it says here. He has these two sons born to Joseph and his wife. Verse 51, Joseph named his older son Manasseh, which means forgetfulness. For he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. And then Joseph named his second son Ephraim, which means fruitfulness, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of grief. I think this is powerful. I think it's powerful because you get this little window at the very end of the passage into the mindset of Joseph. And I think if Joseph were standing here today and you were saying, Joseph, we've all had dark nights of the soul. And we've got them in our past and we're still trying to figure them out. What would you advise us to do, Joseph? And here he comes. And he says, God has given me forgetfulness and he has given me fruitfulness. He is giving me the blessing of being able to let go of the past. And that's big. Am I saying, oh, just forget it. Just forget the thing that happened to you. No. No. But we often, we often ruminate on our past. Do you know what ruminate is? Ruminate, ruminate is like chow, cows chew the cud. Do you know what that is? Right? So they eat the food, and they swallow it down, and they barf it back up. And they chew it some more for real. They do that. And then they chew it again and again and again. You're like, well, that's insane. But it's what we do with our past. And some of you were re-chewing some stuff last night and you couldn't get to sleep because you were chewing it so much. And you know what's 
so, it's, it's so enlightening about chewing the cud to me is it doesn't taste better the second time. Definitely doesn't taste better the third time or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth. And neither does your past. So why are you doing it? But we are. And we can't let it go. And he's not being flippant with us. Joseph isn't being flippant with us here. He's saying, God gave me this gift called forgetfulness. And I'm letting the bitterness go. And I'm letting my past go. And I'm letting everything that happened to me go. Do you see the wisdom in this young man? What an amazing gift of God. And I'm just going to tell you today, I don't think that started when he became prime minister. I think his pattern of intentionally choosing to forget things happened way back in the jail cell. He was not going to be bound by those things. This is about trust. (laughs) Why do we ruminate? I would suggest to you, you have convinced yourself that I need to process the past more. If I process the past more, maybe I'm going to see something I didn't see before. If I process the past more, maybe I'll figure out how to never do that again. If I process the past more, maybe I'll keep this pain alive in me and this bitterness and this unforgiveness. Do you see it all? I've got to keep remembering. I can't ever forget. And we tell ourselves that. We make those little speeches to ourselves. And we tell ourselves it's okay to keep chewing it over and over and over again. Here's the thing. Don't trust yourself so much. Trust him. The blessing of forgetfulness, of letting it all go, is a choice that, God, you've got that. Scripture says in the New Testament, why don't you take captive of every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. It's like, well, I can't control my own thoughts. I'm not saying you can control your own thoughts, but so many of us, the thoughts come and we could simply make a conscious choice that I'm not going to allow myself to go there tonight. I'm going to think about something else. I'm going to do something else. I've let myself do it too many times. I'm just going to shut it down. And would Jesus be there with you with power to help you shut it down? Let it go. And then God will wipe all tears from their eyes. Amen. We'll eventually let it all go. Amen. Why don't you guys stand right now? We've got prayer teams that are going to be in the back of the room, specifically that corner in the back of the room. If things have been stirred in you today and you know that you need prayer, you would like some people to just come around you, we've got a team actually every single week that is always waiting for you back there to pray for you. If you would like prayer support, you just like to talk to somebody. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask for freedom from our past. And I don't mean to devalue our past or pretend like it didn't happen. But Lord, I pray that you would break the power that it has over us. And some of us are holding on to things that aren't helpful. God, would you teach us a new way? And God, for those of us, God, that are have gone through something, Lord, just maybe so complex, so deep, so painful, that we're still wrestling to try to figure out where in the world you were, Father, in the midst of all of that. I pray for a blessing of revelation. Speak to us right now. Speak to our hearts. Jesus, you are a healer. Come and heal us, Lord. Heal our past. You can. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.